Australian artist, Canadian, uh, was asked about his prospects in the new digital economy on the radio. I heard it sitting on the gardener, uh, and uh, when he, what his response was, what his prospects were, he said, "We're entering a golden age." Um, this idea came to be embraced by artists, policymakers, the media, and many, many others worldwide. At the time, peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing had become the default way uh, for people to access virtually unlimited content uh, on the, uh, online, and it was done for free. Uh, there was a widespread belief uh, that the digital era would usher in a utopia for both musicians and consumers. Now, in return for the collapse of their traditional marketplace, uh, artists were uh, told that they would make more money from concerts, uh, merchandise, and other means. In hindsight, we should have cast a more skeptical eye to these predictions. For today, artists struggle more than ever uh, to earn a living, uh, and the creative middle class, as it was, has virtually ceased to exist. They work longer hours for scandalously less money. Author, composer, and virtual reality pioneer, Jaron Lanier, uh, recently concluded, and I quote, we have seen an implosion of career opportunities for those who have devoted their lives to cultural expression. And here in Canada, our creators, the people who have built our nation's cultural foundation and much of the intellectual property that we export, they're struggling. Uh, along with the people and businesses who support them. Uh, just as youth today are told they must accept a world of precarious employment, the gutting of the creative class for over the past two decades has been presented as an inevitability. And it's time that we question this supposition. We must resist the idea that we cannot change the circumstances in which we live. This is an outlet that is founded on a sort of hyper-capitalist technological determinism in which the market rules all and governments need to get out of the way. Just a week ago, The Guardian published an article uh, on this subject and pointed at Ayn Rand as the foundation of this. And the foundation of Ayn Rand's theories are an outright contempt for the state. And today's Randians are in power in the United States. Trump cites her as the foundation as his favorite, the fountainhead as his favorite book. Tillerson, Paul Ryan, but also Rain Rand is the foundation of the princes of Silicon Valley. Why? They're, it, 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 t it caters to a sort of a single-minded vision. The idea that you don't have to ask for permission, uh, you pursue a personal vision regardless of the outcome. But we have to remember that we live in a social democracy, a place where people, not corporations, not plutocrats, get to decide how to order their lives. We have to be able to see the world as it might and should be. It was people, not corporations, who gave Canada universal health care because people decided that that was the way they wanted to live their lives. We inherited this great tradition and we can deploy it to restore the balance. To map out a solution, we should first consider, though, how the creative community got where it got to today. So the foundation for most of the rules and regulations which govern our modern digital environment are the 1996 World Intellectual Property Organization Internet Treaties. At the time those treaties were adopted, in 1996, less than 1% of the world's population was online. It was two and a half years before Napster appeared, four and a half years before the iPod, eight years before YouTube, and a decade before Spotify. The people who set those rules in 1996 were well-intentioned, but in reality, they were guessing. 
And it's been 20 years since those early WIPO guesses. So how are we doing? Well, according to WIPO's stated goals, the treaties would, and I quote, emphasize the outstanding significance of copyright protection as an incentive for literary and artistic creation. And it would, quote, recognize the need to maintain a balance between the rights of authors and the larger public interest. Now, these are laudable goals, but everything was going to come down to finding the correct balance that would supercharge a digital economy, a digital marketplace, for the benefit both of creators and the, mar and the public. Technology advocates and so-called intermediaries argued that in order for the new technological infrastructure to get off the ground, creators would have to give up, forego, copyright payments that would otherwise have been required before the copyright rules were introduced. This was implemented in copyright laws worldwide by granting them safe harbors from liability and exceptions to royalties they would otherwise have had to pay. According to this quid pro quo, creators would be better off by gaining access to larger, more diverse marketplace. This was the promise of the golden age. It was a bargain. It was a social contract. And it was one that very quickly turned Faustian. Economist Olivier Bomsell characterized the new arrangement as a massive system of cross-subsidies. By foregoing money, otherwise payable to them, the creative community would subsidize the technological infrastructure development. Well, if there is a golden age, it has eluded a new generation of musicians. In 2011, the average artist in Canada made just $7,200 from music-related activity. According to a 2013 study, um, this was far short of a living wage. More than 80% of writers in Canada earn income from their writing that is below the poverty line. And that's just outrageous. Creators are not alone in their struggle to stay afloat in the new economy. The English economist Guy Standing argues that technologies are disrupting the way in which income and earnings are distributed. He describes the appearance of a gap between the increasing growth and concentration of profits and the decline and increasing uncertainty of wages, giving rise to a new social class that we all now know as the precariat. Creators, I would argue, are the precariat's charter members. Musicians are struggling at a time when music is generating fabulous amounts of money. It's just that very little of it seems to be getting to them. Now, part of the problem has to do with the growing popularity of online subscription and ad-supported music streaming services. Ad-supported services like YouTube and SoundCloud have driven most of the increase in digital music consumption while delivering far less revenue than paid services. A subscription service, Spotify for example, returned $18 a year per consumer, $18 a year per consumer in 2014 compared to YouTube's $1. Ad-supported services like YouTube with more than 13 times more users than paid services have delivered less than one-third of the royalties. The resulting disparity between digital music revenues earned by the music community and the growing consumption has been dubbed the value gap. In 2016 and 2017, both Europe and the US, in both in Europe and the US, thousands of artists have petitioned their government to address this gap and rebalance the rules. In Canada, more than 2,600 creators have issued a similar call in a letter to Heritage Minister Melanie Jolie. The letter, uh, submitted jointly by Music Canada, Canadian Independent Music Association, SOCAN, the Canadian Country Music Association, the Writers uh, Union of Canada, the Playwrights Guild of Canada, and other stakeholders, expresses the hope 
that Minister Jolie recognizes the value and crucial place of creators' work in the Canadian economy and asks that she put creators at the heart of future policy making. The assembly of so many creators from so many fields around a single idea, which is a call to rebalance the playing field so that creators continue to build on Canada's great cultural legacy, well, that's nothing less than extraordinary. With one voice, they have, they have announced their concern that too many creators are being squeezed out of the marketplace. That while Canada's creative professionals have led Canada in the digital shift, they struggle to earn a livelihood from it. Many artists have shared that letter online, adding their own experiences. For example, Juno-nominated Ottawa musician Kathleen Edwards posted this to her Facebook page. Fellow Canadian musicians and creators, read this letter and tell me it doesn't ring true. Every company from Spotify to Rogers and Bell Media enjoys the benefit of an outdated copyright law that fundamentally doesn't appropriately compensate the creators of the content they use to make money. She went on, sign this letter. I did. If you know people in the creative arts in Canada, share it. It's important that Canadians know and appreciate that artists contribute to the economy in this country and that their intellectual property deserves to be protected. This isn't a please give us a handout letter. It's a please implement policy that protects us letter. Now we know that our government is listening. Last month, following the Canadian content in a digital world consultations, Minister Jolie said publicly that what she had heard loud and clear was, quote, the fact that creators should be at the center of our future policy, that we should address the issue of fairness to creators when it comes to how they can make a living in this digital age, close quote. So now we're waiting. What are they going to do? Well, if you will allow me, I'll turn, down, turn now to some things that the government should consider doing. Any approach to the problem facing Canada's creators needs to be holistic and multi-jurisdictional at the local, provincial, and federal levels. Music Canada, for example, identified local policy options to improve the business environment for creators and creative businesses in 2015, in its 2015 Music Cities report. A growing number of municipalities are discovering the job creation, economic growth, cultural growth, and other opportunities that music can generate. And as many of you know, there is a full day Music City, Music City Summit that is happening in this hotel as I speak. And it's bringing global city planners and their music uh, and, their, uh, and, and the music industry together. At the provincial level, Ontario and British Columbia have created substantial music funds and music friendly policies such as strategies to facilitate live music performances. Now, for her part, Minister Jolie has asked people across the country to think big, to be ambitious, and to step outside the box. The government has made it clear that it wants a new toolkit, those are her words, to confront the challenges facing Canada's creators when it seeks to create a new social contract. Well, here are some thoughts about how our government might apply the four levers that are available to it. The government can legislate, it has program funding, it has policies and treaties, and it has institutions. Those are the levers, so let's take them one by one. Legislation. Simply put, the government of Canada needs to end all of the cross-subsidies paid by creators to digital and traditional broadcast businesses, many of which now are unimaginably wealthy. The goal was initially to get those businesses off the ground, job done. Policies and treaties. Following the example of provincial and municipal policies that are designed to attract foreign direct investment into the domestic music economy, the federal government could also pitch in with supportive policies of its own. In addition, it could promote 
Canada as the brilliant music tourism destination that we are. Both of these levers, legislation and policies, are ultimately the focus of the Creator's letter to Minister Jolie. In the words of that letter, Canada has two major opportunities to stand up for Creators over the next year. Your department's ongoing cultural policy review and the five-year mandated review of the Copyright Act, which is started to, to, slated to start in 27, uh, November of this year. Turning now to the third lever, program funding. Obviously, we need to keep Canada's enviable system of mu music program funding in line with inflation and changing marketplace realities. I was therefore very pleased to see Minister Jolie announce an investment of $4.15 million in export funding to promote Canadian artists around the world. Other solutions could include alleviating the dire housing affordability situation facing artists via infrastructure spending and developing skills and entrepreneurial training programs for artists. Institutions. The federal government has already taken positive steps to increase funding for the CBC and the Canadian Council for the Arts. Next, it should modernize the Copyright Board of Canada and, to tur and turn it into a true business development office for the creative industries. Just this past December, the Standing Senate Committee on Banking, Trade and Commerce released a report and it was called Copy the Copyright Board, a Rational for Urgent Review. The report stated that the Copyright Board of Canada plays a pivotal role, and it does, in Canada's cultural sector. Yet from what the committee heard, the board is, and I'm quoting, dated, dysfunctional, and in dire need of reform. Now, in keeping with Minister Jolie's aspiration to go in new and bigger directions, I think the government should look at funding music education to help make up for growing shortfalls that have put music programs across the country, particularly for inner city youth, remote and rural and indigenous communities in jeopardy. For that matter, the liberal arts in general are at risk. The federal government needs to exercise a leadership role in reconnecting our young people with the importance of a liberal arts education and with the importance of creativity. You know, John Adams, when he visited France in 1780, uh, wrote home saying that, and I'm not going to get the quote right, but his point was, he, he said, I need to study politics and such and such so that my son will be able to study, and then he listed off a series of technical, uh, technical studies that, like, that, 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 that they would study mathematics and so on and so forth. But they would study that, science and technology and engineering and math, that, that his children would study that so that their children could study the arts. And I think that, that aspiration is breaking down and that the liberal arts are suffering an across the board degradation. Rebuilding respect for the humanities is a nationally important uh, issue. Now, the other thing that Minister Jolie has asked, and I find it quite interesting, is how can the government use content to promote a stronger democracy? And I think it's something that we're all quite concerned about these days. Um, in searching for a response, um, I think that we must consider that to the extent that we allow voices of our creators to be compromised or marginalized, uh, our democracy will suffer a great loss. Think, for example, of the essential role played throughout history by poets, musicians, filmmakers, and novelists in the fight for democracy and civil rights. Young people today, creators, and other members of the precariat are objecting to the difficult circumstances that they face, just as people fought against the brutalities of the first industrial revolution. In a social democracy, we do not have to just get used to it, which is what we're being told by a lot of government folks. We have the right to decide what sort of a world we live in. And this got me thinking about the intimate connection throughout history between creators and democracy. And I'm going to end on this thought. 
They've always played an essential role in the fight for democracy and civil rights. And here in Canada, we've got an immediate example to hand, Gord Downey's The Secret Path. But to his voice and his name, we could add Pete Seeger, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Vaclav Havel, Billy Holiday, Nina Simone, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and many, many more. These are all people who were banned, exiled, jailed, or worse, for their fight for justice and democratic principles. And I think it's instructive that after the revolution in Czechoslovakia, the people turned not to a strong man or an authoritarian, but to a playwright. That playwright dubbed his revolution the Velvet Revolution because it was powered by illicit cassette tapes of Lou Reed's band, The Velvet Underground. Creators are truly, as Percy Shelley famously said, the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Now, when he says they're legislators, he does not mean they're lawyers. He doesn't necessarily mean they're politicians. What I think he's saying is that creators predict our future, they underpin our future, and they create a framework, political and cultural, for our future. To the extent that we allow voices like that to be compromised or marginalized, our democracy suffers a great loss. Should we get used to the way things are? Well, some of our politicians and virtually the entire techno-utopian community says yes. But why should we get used to this? The citizens who opposed the brutal child labor regimes of the first industrial revolution did not get used to that. They fought to change them, and they did change them. And they changed the world for the better. And we're in the midst of what some are calling the fourth industrial revolution now. And while it has ushered in great booms, it has also ushered in great banes. Mary and Percy Shelley fully understood this when they wrote Frankenstein. They understood that the unmediated introduction of new technology into society can create monsters, but it does not need to. Not if technology is accountable to the people, to all people. So my answer to the minister's question about democracy is this. If you want a stronger democracy that is less vulnerable to special interests, that distributes wealth equitably, then do everything in your power to restore balance to the world in which our creators live. Encourage them, enable them, they are not living in a golden age. That was the promise, but they didn't get it. The promise was broken, and we owe it to them, and we owe it to them now. And we would do well to remember that the fight for democracy and justice has always had a soundtrack. Thank you.